want to thank you all for uh, coming and uh, joining me today for beadwork uh, presentation for the beadwork calendar system. Um, I am Arlen Johnson of the Spherical Cow Group. I've been a developer with beadwork for um, actually about 12 years, uh, though beadwork has only had that name for the last nine. Um, and today we're going to uh, basically talk about what beadwork is. Um, we're going to look at the features of beadwork as they currently stand and take a look at beadwork futures. And I also need to give a, a state of the presentation talk, which I will do today, because um, there have been a lot of uh, interesting changes coming to the project. So beadwork is, this is our standard blurb, uh, is an open source, a standards compliant, open source comprehensive calendaring and event system. And I've highlighted standards compliance here because it's very, very important to the project. It's a core value of beadwork to make sure that we comply with calendaring standards, that we are interoperable with other calendaring systems. And uh, we, we see it as not just a core value, but the real means to our success uh, with, with calendaring. And to that end, we have been, for, over, for a decade, members of CalConnect, which is the Calendaring and Scheduling Consortium, uh, which works hard between all of these different participants to make sure that our calendaring solutions are interoperable. And um, through this uh, connection, we've also been working on calendaring standards and so forth. Um, two of the members of, of the Beadwork community have been very involved in this body and have worked on such things as uh, authorship of international time zone standards, uh, co-authorship of a number of other standards and calendaring. So when we participate in standards, we're, we, we're really talking about uh, having a, a deep understanding of how these things work and striving towards trying to get the calendaring communities to work together. Because we, we recognize that this is actually very useful for the Beadwork project, for calendaring in general. And we also understand that any calendaring solution that you're going to have at your organization, at your campus, um, is not going to probably stand alone. Uh, some commercial organizations can say, hey, we're going to use one calendaring system. Everybody must abide by it. That almost never happens at a university. And truly, in most organizations, they're going to have calendaring solutions that differ between one uh, organization in the USA and one in Europe. So we recognize that for us to succeed in calendaring and to have uh, systems that work, we have to have these, these tools be interoperable, which is why the standards matter so much. So I always begin talking a little bit about that. So beadwork as a calendaring system needs to support an awful lot of stuff. It supports public calendaring, personal calendaring. It's got a full uh, CalDAV server in the background, a time zone server. It has web services such as SOAP and REST, uh, a full API that can be used to develop other software against it. And um, we've had a whole lot of recent enhancements, which I will actually talk about during the course of this presentation. So we have well over 50 organizations running beadwork, uh, particularly in the public calendaring, but also running uh, personal calendaring as well. And these are organizations which I just went out and looked for. These are those that we are directly aware of. They've either told us or we've had some hand in setting them up. But we keep stumbling across beadwork installations all over the place. And that's one of the great joys of running open source software is it's, it's kind of like watching your children grow up. You get to see them off in the fields running and suddenly they'll pop up doing something different that you never expected. And we find beadwork surfacing in ways that, that uh, are sometimes surprising. But um, we know of, of at least 50 and we suspect there are many more. Uh, speaking of which, our, we're really pleased to announce that this just past Friday, um, Columbia University has released Beadwork as its new public events system. And they're releasing it in a number of phases. Um, so that's, that's very exciting for us. And we also want to thank them for some sponsorship, uh, quite a bit of sponsorship, towards the 310 development of the latest release. And that's been exciting to see. All right, so some important features that have come out in version 310 are responsiveness. So we have a responsive public web client, so it works quite well on tablets, on phones, um, and uh, we also have a system by which we can embed complex filtering for public web client, for the public web calendaring and data feeds. And so, for example, in this case, uh, we have a bunch of events that have been returned, a query's been put in, a simple search for mystery, which is ended with, oh, okay, I want mystery in book clubs. 
and I want it to be specifically at Balboa or at Allied Gardens. So you can send into the, into the, the, uh, the public event system arbitrarily complex Boolean expressions searching for and filtering against all of the events in the, in the public pool. Um, by default, these come up as a set of, of views that you can uh, and together, and then within any specific collection, they get ORed together. So it's very powerful. We believe that the default setup out of the box works pretty well, and for the most part is, is what folks have asked for for many years. So we're happy uh, and pleased with that. Um, it's accessible. The public web client, we believe to be uh, WCAG 2.0 AAA um, compliant, and we're working towards the same for other clients. Um, this would, I would love to have an accessibility expert actually take a look at this and evaluate um, these, uh, the, the web clients for, for true accessibility, because I'm sure that there's always improvement that can be made. But the main point here is that we're very devoted to the, the idea and the, the practice of accessibility in our clients. So we work towards that and are continuing to do so. It is primarily, or mostly, a no-build system. It is completely capable of being downloaded, fired up, and then configured through a web client. Um, I say mostly because if you want to do some of the sort of more peculiar things or the newer uh, things, you might still have to run a build. But it's not necessary. Um, we put together our quick start kind of as a black box. You download it, you run it, configure it through a JMX console, through a web client, and then you can run a public event system or a personal calendaring or a CalDAV server, just like that. There we go. Um, we've been working towards scalability at, you know, massive scalability. We're not quite there yet, but we're working very hard toward it. We've taken a NoSQL approach uh, using Elasticsearch, and that's been, that's been kind of fun. And uh, we've also got Vertex in place to try to help with performance, specifically with pulling data feeds, which is one of the more popular features of the system, especially for public events, of pulling out massive numbers of data feeds and then displaying them everywhere or importing them elsewhere and, and so forth. So let's talk about public events calendaring and what that one means. And we have a concept in public events of having a big events pool so under the hood, architecturally here, there's only one actual calendar collection from the calendar standpoint, right? And what we do is events administrators who are added to groups, these, these groups up here, you've got all, they usually represent the, the normal um, PR distribution channels around your campus. So in one case, you've got a communications office that's going to be releasing uh, event information, um, and other news items. In another place, you might have a, a dean that's got a whole lot, number of events or a lecture series, and you might have your athletics office that has sporting events that need to be published. So across the ca a campus or an organization, we tend to know who these people are. And so these administrative groups are built to model those kinds of relationships. And so people can go into the administrative client for public events and add their events. Simple as that. They get added to this big pool of events, uh, all of which tagged as we go, and I'll look some at that. Um, it's also possible for any member of your community who's empowered to do so to simply suggest events into what we call this uh, submissions queue. Those get dumped into a separate calendar and then await approval by a, a moderator within the other administrative groups. So that's another uh, mechanism by which we pour events into this big pool. Then getting the data out is done in a number of different ways. On the one hand, we have what we, can, what we call calendar suites, which are essentially web views or public web calendars that present filtered views of the calendar data and of the events. Um, so, and this is done by building in subscriptions into the big public pools. Like, I, I want lectures. I want specifically English lectures, or I want uh, music concerts or whatever I'd, I'd like to build, and then those get output into a set of views into the public uh, calendar suites. Another very popular approach to, of course, dragging data out of this stuff is taking data feeds. And these can be in the form of raw data feeds in standard formats such as an iCal file or XCal or JCal, all of which supported by the standard. Those are, by the way, XML, uh, an iCal rep XML representation of iCal or JSON represent representation of iCal, or some standard RSS JSON, CSV, or HTML, or just the raw XML output of beadwork, which gives you everything in the format that we just dump it in. Um, also, we can produce uh, widgets, which are 
for copying and pasting and being placed into a static website. And that's, that's been pretty popular because a departmental web administrator can just pick the stuff up, throw it on their page, and they're done. So they've got somebody entering events, they can just pop them on and they get what they need. Um, so I'm going to show some of the pictures of the public calendaring, and it's important to understand that beadwork is a lot more than public calendaring. We do uh, you know, all the other things that I've noted already. Um, but its public events calendaring is widely used, and it's one of the finer options out there if you're looking for a public calendar system. So public calendar suites, as I've talked about, are really that front-end view for a public calendar. And there are a lot of them out there. Here's Colgate. I like showing some of these off just to show the many different ways of theming this stuff from a public calendaring standpoint. University of Virginia, University of Albany, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. This is running version 3.10, as was Colgate. Um, events at Brown, Bishop's University in Canada. Here's Bennington College. A very different take on the, the use of the theme. Though some of these you'll start to note begin to look similar, and that's often because as people run beadwork there, looking at the other places that run beadwork and they think, oh, I like that theme. Can we do something like that? I was like, we love what Yale does. Can we do something like that? So that happens quite a bit. Um, here is the Public University of Navarra in Spain, uh, fully translated into, into Spanish. Um, Duke University, which, who have built kind of a different front end on top of the calendaring engine, um, but very similar in, in form, and the University of Chicago, and so forth. So these that I just showed you were the sort of big behemoth public events systems in which um, most universities will say, all right, pour all your events into this system as much as can be done, and we will expose them all in one place. In fact, that's not what Columbia did. Their, theirs is more like a, a departmental calendar in which they're asking their administrators to pour events into their system, and then they're only going to show a certain subset of them, which is what you get with departmental calendars, which in fact are no different uh, from these other calendars. The large system that shows everything and the departmental calendars that show a subset are actually all the same because what you get inside these calendar suites is just whatever's been filtered to be and, and shown. And so then you can take something like here on the right, you've got the Yale uh, Arts calendar, which is looking only at those events that have been promoted by, the, by Yale Arts. Or to the, to the left, um, I always like showing this one because I think it's interesting. Here is a collection at Rensselaer of all of the uh, campus fairs that the admissions officers like to go to, to recruit. Uh, potential students and, and meet with their families and so forth. And the interesting thing about these events is they're all in the main public events system, but there's not a single person on the Rensselaer campus that would be interested in these, A, because either they're already there, and B, they're none of them local, right? These are going to be happening all over the place. So this particular uh, calendar, these, these events, which are tagged for college fairs, never ever show up in the public events calendar at RPI, but because they're all in the central pool and we can filter them out, we can provide them here, allowing users, families, uh, prospective students to download these events, put them in their calendar, and so forth. So the feeds and widgets aspect of beadwork is, is powerful. It, it allows you to build um, pretty complex expressions into the system and pull data out however you like. And for producing such things as the academic calendar that you see up here, or just a small blurb on a page, um, output to digital signage, um, email blasts, whatever you need to create out of your events system. And in 3.10, we have a, um, basically a light box that pops up. You search around inside your public UI, you do the filtering you want to do, and you say, all right, give me a feed of that, and that's all that you have to do. Um, that's worked out pretty well, um, and you can see some of the features here in the different data formats that I've already talked about. Okay, the public events administration tool is, is straightforward, it's rudimentary. When you log in, you get an event form. If you're a public events administrator, and it looks something like this. It has image upload capability, full recurrence support, which I'll show you, and the tagging, which takes place over here to the, uh, to the right, looks something like this. And I wanted to highlight this because it is in building these subscriptions from a calendar suite that you get uh, to do the tagging for the events. And the important part about this is that the tagging is uh, hierarchical and provides over-tagging by category. So what happens if I tag an event in the public system by English department, it's also going to get tagged up the chain. So it gets tagged as the School of Humanities, 
and it gets tagged as you know uh, departments and on, on up. Same with readings. If I if I tag this as readings, it's also tagged as arts. And the real value of this kind of overtagging is twofold. One, it means that in the case of the School of Humanities, they can pull all the events for all of their different departments, say, easily in this mechanism, uh, all, while the English department can just pull things that are of interest to them. They, we could, for example, have seminars in the English department and so forth. But it also means that the end user doesn't have to know much about this, right? They tag things for what they are. They don't have to understand any, you know, how many different tags they have to tag to make sure stuff that shows up in the right place. This takes care of it for them and, and makes it really simple to do. I also like to support, uh, I like to display the support we have for recurrence, recurrence information. We have perhaps one of the stronger uh, systems for supporting recurring events. And uh, for example, you can set up recurrence rules to show events, say, on the first Tuesday and the third Thursday of the month and so forth. And it can get pretty complex, but it's supported uh, quite well within the system. All right, submitting an event through the, the submissions client, as we call it, is a little different. It's more of a wizard because we don't expect the users of this system to know much about calendaring, and we don't even allow them to have recurrence information because it's easy to goof that up if you don't have a little bit of understanding of calendaring. So the submissions client allows any member in your community to log in, suggest an event, um, and that then gets approved by an events administrator in the public events system. So that's how that works. So on to personal calendaring. And I can go through more details of any of those if you have any questions. So the personal calendaring system is much more what you might expect when you think about calendaring. Calendaring is an, over, uh, is an overused term in a lot of ways. But when we're talking about personal and group events, we have uh, each individual user has a calendar route and any number of calendar collections that they want to add things to. They can share full access control between their uh, individual calendars. They can share um, read-write access. There's complete, complex ACL support inside that system. However, we also have a simpler means of sharing through the, the newer uh, sharing mechanisms, which is more wizard-like, which I'll show you in a moment, which can also be done uh, right through your devices or through the web client. We have a new service that's being implemented, a new uh, uh, standard called VPOL, which is consensus scheduling, which I'll show a little bit of as well, which is basically a standard mechanism for doing doodle-style scheduling. So a person will create a list of choices, people will vote on those choices, and so forth. So that's all supported in our personal calendaring environment. I've put the public events system up here on the left um, to kind of make a point that the personal side of things can subscribe into other event systems. It doesn't have to just be beadwork, right? You can have iCal subscriptions to other sources. You can subscribe into a beadwork public events uh, feed with a filter. And um, that's pretty nice, especially if you have a campus that's running a public event system and you've also got, say, a personal calendaring environment there as well. So the personal client out of the box looks something like this, although this is the one that's been branded for Rensselaer. To the left, you have your uh, calendar collections. To the right, you have your grid of events, and on we go. But it's also uh, supported through CalDAV. So if you have a calendar system, uh, the personal calendar client running, uh, the personal calendar system running, you can actually just type in um, your server name, if you've got dot well known established on your server, and then log in with your uh, ID and password, and boom, you've got it on your iPhone, on your Android, on any CalDAV uh, client that, that's out there. And with this, you get sharing, standard sharing mechanisms, notifications right on your device. So a user may not want to go and use this uh, web client at all. But if you've got things such as course schedules or other um, things being automatically delivered to their calendars, because they've each got a calendar in the system, you could have your users just then sign in and have that stuff on their mobile device, which is extremely powerful. I've done that for going on 10 years. Um, not quite 10 years, but there. And, um, and it's, it's worked very well. And that's one of the more exciting aspects of, of Beadwork. So calendar sharing in the web UI looks like this. If I want to, this is one of the newer features. Um, it used to be that you'd have to go through a set of ACLs and say, oh, I want to share read access and write access with that person. The problem with ACLs is though they're very powerful and you can do many, many things, and you can still get at them through this advanced options uh, tag that you see up there. 
most end users are going to be like, what? 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 <laughs> what is that? What are these? What are these access control lists? So instead, in this case, it's much simpler. Just a simple wizard. You put in a person's user ID and say, I want to share this calendar with read access, or I want to give them write access to. Read, read, write. Simple as that. Pass it along. The other user is sent a notification, which if they're on an iPhone, they will actually uh, get notification of. And, um, and they'll get notification here in the web client as well. All right. So here are some of the upcoming features that are actually already part of 3.10 and that are not sort of made clearly available yet but are bubbling up to the surface as we refine them and enhance them. So vPoll, which is consensus scheduling, which I'd mentioned, is a, a mechanism for doing a standard approach to the Doodle-style um, scheduling. So a user can create a series of choices such as, I want a tennis match. Hey, you want to try these different days? Um, and send that out to a set of voters to, to, to choose what they think is best. And at the end, we can have um, the organizer pick the winner. So when you get a stack of these things, you have different people coming in with different choices. You know, this one's great, this one's OK. No, not on that one. And it's just the stuff that we're used to. The nice thing about this is, though, as soon as the winner is picked, standard scheduling happens because it's inside of a calendaring system. So I say, pick the winner, and broop, it's automatically scheduled with all the people who are involved. That's really nice. The organizer remains the organizer. All the other stuff gets passed right into the calendars. It's booked, and you're set to go. Um, some things that we're looking to do with this would be to set up the system so that um, some of the scheduling aspects would automatically happen. Like, you don't necessarily say, allow auto-scheduling for vPoll. You always allow auto-scheduling for vPoll. Because I have voted on it. I just want that stuff to immediately go in. Otherwise, the user will receive a notification saying, someone scheduled this event with you. You're like, oh, yeah, there it is. Boom. And in it goes. Uh, speaking of notifications, we're looking to improve the way they work. They work quite well on the mobile devices. The web client notifications appear when someone wants to share a calendar with you, when someone's trying to schedule with you, and they show up on the right-hand side kind of in the, a Facebook format, though it's pretty rudimentary right now. So we're looking to improve that, and we expect improvements to occur over the next... Uh, next few months. Event registration for public events has long been a part of beadwork for the last, I think, two releases. And uh, thanks to some of the support from Columbia University uh, Information Technology, we're looking to improve this. They're replacing a system that they've had for many years called Sundial, which is quite impressive, the system. And it allows for um, event registration, uh, credit card transaction handling, and so forth which we have not uh, previously supported, but we look to support that in the future as we move forward. But the idea here is that within your public events system, you, you'll see um, an opportunity to log in to register for the event, which at Columbia they're doing via CAS. And they log in, and you can pick however many number of tickets have been provided to select. Maybe it's just one, or maybe you can pick up to four, or whatever that's arbitrarily chosen within the administrative side. As you can see on the lower right-hand side here, you can say if people can register for it, we can allow them to set up to 10 reservations or one reservation. And the starting time for reservations is here, and it, reservations uh, will close at this time. And then you get the list of, of users, which can be downloaded as a CSV or managed. Um, the administrators can reserve a certain number of tickets if they need to have special uh, uh, VIP access to things and so forth. So we're pretty excited about seeing enhancements to that because it's a long-standing, um, it's been, a, it's had a lot of interest over the years. So that's going to be fun. Also, in 3.10, and not yet bubbled up to the surface, though it can be turned on in the JMX console, are, is, is the opportunity for one set of administrative groups within one calendar suite to suggest events to another set of administrators in another calendar suite. So you might have a school of engineering and a humanities department with two completely different suites where they've got events going in and out. And they might be creating an event and say, oh, you know what? I want to suggest this over to the English department because I want to make sure that they tag it in such a way that it bubbles into their, into their view. And through the suggestion queue, when I as an administrator receive a suggested event, if I say, yep, I'll accept it, it'll automatically tag it as my, with my tags that are in that suite which will, in most cases, make it appear within my calendar suite. 
So that's, that's something that, that was supported by Columbia, and we're happy to have it. Also, a very simple workflow. In the past, we've always had a sp support for the concept of roles within beadwork. Um, but in fact, in the very earliest releases, we kind of deprecated it a bit and kind of hid it. Um, that's bubbled back. There's been a request for a very simple workflow, which could get more complicated, where there are event administrators who are authors but are not allowed to actually publish the event. So they can create it. And then there are approvers within the same group who then can take a look at the approval queue and make sure everything is right and then go ahead and approve it out the door. So simple workflow has been added as well. All right. Um, this is also very important, I believe. Uh, we've had significant improvements to external subscriptions in the, in the public events world. So it's very common, especially at academic institutions, that you'll have one public events system in one place, and perhaps you've got an athletics uh, website that produces its own events and is very specifically designed to do that. The athletics department really would like their events to be within your system, and you can subscribe to them and so forth, but what we wanted to have was a much better mechanism for synchronization between those data feeds. We've done data feeds into the public event system for years. We're doing a better job of this now with stronger category mapping, allowing for better filtering, um, and potentially location contact processing along the way, and we expect this to be enhanced and improved as we go. So that's some exciting new development. Here we go. All right, so very, very quickly, I'm gonna to touch just, I think, three slides on the architecture and some of the integration ideas behind beadwork. So the beadwork architecture, I reworked it last night. This is a little loose, <laughs> but it's kind of close to how the system works. And when you download a beadwork quick start, you can treat that as a black box, drop it in place, and, and run with it. You've got a, a public events system, you've got a CalDAV server, you've got a card dev server, you've got time zone support, and all of that. But in this case, um, up at the top, we have basically our, our web clients all in blue, some of the other uh, servers that we, that we work with, like the CalDAV server, which is very, very powerful. And underneath this, the system, this is all running in JBoss. Um, so we get all of the J2EE support that comes with that and JMS for our indexer and so forth. We've got uh, Elasticsearch being used as the, as the mechanism, especially for producing the, the public data. And um, behind that, we have a, a, a relational database. The JMX console at the bottom is used to set up configuration for the system, um, even though in many cases it, what it ends up doing is publishing XML files down in the server, which you could modify by hand. You don't have to. And for a lot of uh, groups, they're much more accustomed to downloading a, a package, messing around with the configurations through a web client, and then running. So this is pretty close to what uh, is happening here. We have also... Um, put in place in this version Vertex to help with performance support for our data feeds in particular. So um, through the public calendar suites, you can now generate these widgets or requests for filtered data feeds. That gets pushed out through Vertex and um, for what we hope will be massive scalability. Um, using Beadwork as a platform for development of other services um, has been done in a number of places. Duke University has done it for mobile. Uh, Chicago has done so, um, and we also have the Beadwork Sometime, which was one time known as the Scheduling Assistant from uh, University of, of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And this is a very interesting tool, uh, and one that we'd like to, to integrate more and start to promote as uh, part of the Beadwork system. It allows individuals to, to set up their, their schedules so that others can book appointments with them and then auto-scheduling occurs. So this is particularly useful for things like office hours or for scheduling appointments with counselors um, and uh, works nicely with beadwork and we'd like to get that uh, packaged up and out the door uh, more fully. So, all right. So that's beadwork the product and I'll talk a bit about beadwork the project now and where things stand. Um, as we are. We are nine years old as of March 2015, very close to a decade. Though, if you go all the way back to the beginning of our work with the UW calendar, that goes to 2003 for, for my participation and a little bit earlier for it. So, closer to 12 uh, years old. 
So our first release of beadwork was in 2006, and our most recent release of 310 is 2014. And of course, we, we continue to produce uh, bug fix quick starts and release those out the door. Um, we have seven committers that are, that are involved with beadwork, five that are primarily on the beadwork core project. We have two that work on beadwork sometime. But of course, we've also got lots of contributions from, from those who are saying, oh, hey, here's a bug fix over here or some documentation improvements over there that we pull into the, into the project. So a lot more than seven in total, but there are seven actively committing to the project. Um, currently, we run in subversion for uh, everything from 3.0 up to to 3.6, I mean, to 3.10, there we go. Um, and lots of commits into that as we continue to improve and fix things and so forth. But we are moving to GitHub for 4.0 for a number of reasons. It's, a, it's convenient, it's a nice free service that we can use. Um, at this point, we have 24 repositories in the beadwork collection. So all of the different parts of the system that I showed you in that one slide, such as the CalDAV server, are in their own repository for development. So these things are, are are compartmentalized. We have, uh, over the past three years, about 6,800 commits, and uh, that looks to grow as we reach for the 4.0 release that we hope to, to get to before long. We've also been using GitHub for our issue tracking, and that seems to have worked pretty well for us. Um, I'm a big JIRA fan, but putting this out in GitHub in the same place that we're doing, uh, we're moving to, has, has worked well. The steering committee consists of nine members and the number of organizations that you see down, down below, um, including our newest member, Greg Allen, who I wanted to, to bring here, who joined just this past year. So discussion about beadwork and uh, the committee meets regularly. We, we're pretty active and we, uh, we keep moving forward. We've also got Nick Blair uh, from a few years ago, who's one of the, the, the primary contributors with uh, beadwork sometime. So a lot of activity here. It's international, and um, yeah, it's good. One of the sort of significant uh, developments for us is the interest that seems to have outpoured in the last few years for sponsored development of the project. And we've been getting many, many inquiries by groups that would like to sponsor development for beadwork. So this has been interesting. Um, we want to particularly highlight sponsorship that's come recently from Columbia University Information Technology that has sponsored a lot of development for some of the features you just saw that are bubbling into to 310. And from the Nashville Public Library, who uh, contributed funds to help support development of the 310 um, public client. So um, this appears to be a direction in which the project is going to continue to go. And um, there's been a ton of interest. So uh, we're, we feel very gratified by that and are very thankful to all of those who have uh, contributed towards the development of the, of the work. Uh, I want to particularly acknowledge Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute um, for their support of the development over the past uh, decade. Um, they've been a long sponsor of core beadwork development. And to that, three of the active members of the beadwork community and developers and the leadership have been employed at Rensselaer for the duration of its, um, of its existence. Gary Schwartz, in particular, the, the chair of our steering committee um, and the director of the group that Mike Douglas and myself were in. Um, we started at Rensselaer way back participating in the University of Washington calendar in 2003 um, when I first went out to, to, to visit them. And we were there to just offer some uh, some code and, and participate with them. And over the course of time, uh, the baton was passed and Rensselaer sort of became the development home of, uh, of beadwork. We joined CalConnect a decade ago and began participating in the interoperability testing with you know, Apple and, and, and Google. And, and um, that, that's pretty exciting. And have been actively involved in the standards from there, point, there on. In 2006, beadwork 3.0 got renamed and from there, in 2010, we joined JASIG as a sponsored project um, after passing through incubation. In 2012, of course, we've shifted now into a perio. And in 2014, we released Beadwork 310. I raise all of this because last Friday, um, Mike Douglas, the chief architect of the project, has retired from RPI and has moved on to join uh, me with the Spherical Cow Group. And I left Rensselaer this past February as well. So it does look that uh, 
beadwork development is continuing in force, but the locus of development may not be uh, directly at Rensselaer, but sort of outside of it. And, and that's all right. Um, and we want to, I'm going to leave Project Futures in the words of uh, our esteemed leader, Gary Schwartz. And I'll let you read this yourself, but I'll just read two parts of it. He says, Beadwork the project and Beadwork the product are both thriving. And that's absolutely true. And we're, again, very gratified by this. Um, and he notes that although the center of beadwork development is shifting, I anticipate that beadwork development will actually accelerate and not diminish, which I agree with completely and uh, I'm looking forward to. So there's that. And so the beadwork website is now on the new uh, updated Aperio web website, uh, Projects Beadwork. I think I need to do some redirecting myself, as I've noticed that some of the Searches that you find will take you to older places, so we'll get there. And uh, there we go. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your coming, and if you have any questions about beadwork, we can go with it. I'm very accustomed to having my laptop up here so I can start kicking over and doing demos and showing things, but it was uh, a lot more convenient to have it there at the back today. So do you have any questions about any of this stuff? Um, I'm happy to answer them. Ah, that's a good question. The question was, uh, what was the best strategy to jump from 3.9 to 3.10? Um, having just done that myself at Rensselaer, um, it was a reasonably st smooth transition. In fact, I found that going from 3.9 to 3.10 was easier than going from 3.8 to 3.9 uh, because of the way I had tried to do it back then. Um, essentially, download the 3.10, if you can. Fire it up on a new system. In the, in the age of virtual machines, it's nice you just get your new environment going if, if you can do it that way, if you have the resources, right? And, um, and you don't have to do a schema change. So you could choose to dump and restore the data, or you can just take the, the database, dump it, restore it directly as a database file, and run it, or just move the data. So there is no data massaging between 3.9 and 3.10. Because it's a 3.0 release, we've worked very, very hard not to have schema changes. When the 4.0 release comes out, <laughs> Forget that. There will be lots of schema changes. But in this case, no schema change. You can just actually directly carry the data one to the other. So you fire it up, um, re-index it, right? Because the indexer is going to need be, to be run. You do that through the JMX console. And then the only thing that really is required is that you manipulate the views through the admin client. So you look at your subscriptions for your calendar suite. How many cal calendar suites are you running? Just the one? That, that makes it very, very, actually, it's, it's easy in either case. Um, by the way, the calendar suites are very much backwards compatible. If you've got an older suite and you plop it in place, they just work, which is nice. And that, that's true all the way back to, I think, I think 3.5 or 3.6. Um, so at that point, you, the new system uses views to establish these menus. So if you've got uh, one set of calendars in your view, They'll be exposed through the new UI. Now, you can use your existing theme and just plop it in place, and you're done. Or if you want to take advantage of the new stuff and the AJAX requests and the endless scroll and all of that, you, uh, you take the new theme and customize it and put your, your branding on it, and you're done. So it is a pretty straightforward process. The vast majority of the work in doing a beadwork public events client is making sure that your calendar structures are in good shape and then doing whatever theming you need to do. We've worked very hard to make the theming as easy as possible. There's a theme settings file where you can simply say, hey, here's my logo here, and you know, CSS, change some colors. You can do all that. Or you can get as crazy as, like, I want to move everything around. Um, pretty simple to do. It's always gratifying uh, when, when I hear people talk about theming beadwork, because um, when they first look at it, it looks alien to some. What we have is a structure by which our, our Java backend, uh, our JSP, produces just XML. That's all it produces. Our JSP level only produces XML. On top of the XML, we run XSLT. People think, well, that's kind of old technology. But the point of that is that then we can transform this into anything we want. And there's a very clean separation between the backend and the front. From that point on, we build on top of that either HTML output or pure JavaScript or 
XML data feeds or whatever we want to have. So you can build an entirely JavaScript client on top of this. So what usually happens is people say, oh, that, that looks XSLT, really? And then they'll start building on it. And I've gone to at least two presentations where people are like, I thought it was going to be hard, but it was so easy. So it's nice to hear. <laughs> but don't take my word for it. I'll have to dig up those old presentations to tell you I'm not lying. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Download the new Quick Start and give it a shot. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, as a, uh, as a project that's more than a decade old, mm. That's, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, oh, yes, correct. Uh, the question, thank you. <laughs> the question was, um, based, you know, from the experience of a, of a project that's a decade old and a Java project that's a decade old, what advice would we give today to someone who's starting right now um, a new project, a, a new Java-based project? Um, well, let me, let me s say one thing first. I'm the UX guy <laughs> and the UI guy. So I'm not the hardcore Java developer. So to some degree, um, I can't speak a, like to a great deal of depth with the, with the full back end. But here's the other thing I will say. I will definitely say. For one, th um, my first word of advice and perhaps word of warning would be, watch out for shiny baubles. You know, the latest and greatest thing. Um, because that can sometimes derail development more than anything else. Like, oh, you know, wow, everybody's using Rails. Let's go use Rails. Oh, wow, everybody's using this. Let's use this, you know. Um, pick a technology, stick with it for a while, and make sure that you understand it exceptionally well and uh, go with it. So um, would Beadwork still builds its JSP la layer on top of struts, for example, which was a good choice 10 years ago. Is it a good choice today? Yeah, it's good enough. And we've not been in any real rush to change it because the layer that that provides for us just produces the XML on which we build all this other stuff. Now, as a UI guy, I take a look at some of the choices I've made over the past 10 years. And we constantly try to make um, improvements within reason that seem to be warranted at the time. So when I started out as a UX and UI guy, um, there really weren't a lot of JavaScript libraries that I felt confident I could use. So we built our own libraries. That's what we did 10 years ago. Um, then along come all of the different libraries, you know, vying to see which one's going to be the best. And so we picked Dojo in early days. It's like, wow, well, that's very consonant with some of the work we're doing in Java, right? You know, it's a, a very developer kind of environment. And jQuery rises up, right? So I think. Staying abreast of what seem to be the right choices at the right time is extremely important through the course of the development process. And um, you know, so we've moved to jQuery. And you know, we've included parts of Bootstrap. We've used the things that we need to use as we go forward. But I think as long as there's a constant look at best practices independent of the technology, and uh, a focus on ease of use for other, you know, other developers, following good practices, then just pick something and, and go with it for as long as it works for you. Um, I, think it's, I think when I was, was a lot younger, I would, I would sometimes apologize and say, well, I know this is, kind of, this is an older piece, and this, is, this part of our system is really shiny, and this part you know, still kind of needs to be updated. And I would say that having run a project um, over the course of 10 years, you end up in that situation. It just happens, where you've got like, wow, here's our new, newly polished feature. Ah, this is awesome. And you kind of look back, and it's like, wow, that old feature over there is kind of crumbly. I need to go and work on that. And you, you look for opportunities to get time to develop that. So um, I think that's just to be expected. So I'm not sure I would recommend any particular technologies. Um, Again, I would just say, you know, pick those things which seem to be widely used, um, reasonably popular. And I, and I say that not because popularity necessarily means it's the right thing, 
but it does mean that you have a larger chance that folks will understand it, will have already had experience with it. I mean, we're moving to GitHub, right? And there are a lot of good reasons for doing that. Number one, it's, I re well, I really like the model of GitHub of, you know, branching and, and, and resubmitting and so forth. So we get better adoption through these things. Um, it's publicly available and it's a nice place to store the, the source. Um, but I would never get into a religious argument about whether GitHub is greater than subversion. I mean, well, I can certainly see the advantages and the benefits. But that's, but that's what it comes down to. It's more of a, of a balanced choosing, right? We, we make our choices based on what seems to be good enough to actually make those choices because every change is expensive. It takes a lot of time and effort to get uh, a, a major shift. So, so that's, that's all. So stick with some technologies. Stay with it for a while, even if you're not entirely convinced that it's, you know, if you're only 85% convinced that that's what you should have chosen, don't worry about it. Stick with it for a while, you know, unless there's an absolute reason to change. And we do that. We went from, um, for our indexing, we were running Lucene. Ultimately, we moved into running Solar, which is a, which is a great system for doing kind of the, the NoSQL thing. And Solar had some problems that we could not get around. They made some changes that made it actually impossible for us to do some of the requests that we needed to do based on events and recurrences and so forth. So um, we've switched to Elasticsearch, which we've been happy with. But you know, each of these big changes you know, introduces new technology and you have to test like crazy. You have to you know, get comfortable and familiar with the new stuff. So um, do it when you must, but pick something and stay. So that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> Yes. Please. Is struts, though very old, still a reasonable choice to start with today? Um, you know, that's an interesting question that I don't know that I can give an authoritative answer to. I'm, I'd be scared to answer that, um, only because, I, I mean, I, part of me would say, sure. But... Um, I think so often I've run into people saying, wow, you're still using struts, why not spring, or why not you know, the latest thing? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I myself would probably choose spring. <laughs> but uh, just because I've, I've had more familiarity just working with that um, on other projects. Uh, but I mean, struts works, especially for what we're doing. So, yeah. All right, anything more? I think we're good. I, Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.